Good morning. We welcome you back to the house of the Lord here at First Baptist Church and glad that you have uh, braved the humidity or the rain, whatever it's doing out there right now. You're always welcome here uh, at the house of the Lord. If you're our guest for the first time, we're glad you're here. We'd love to have a record of your visit so that we might uh, reach out to you. You could do that by um, using a connect card in the pews. Fill it out and uh, put it in one of the offering plates around the service. Uh, and if you're a little more savvy and would prefer that, there's a QR code on your bulletin. If you'd let us know some information, we'd love to make a new friend. May God bless you as you come here to worship the one true living God. You are loved, you're welcome, and you're accepted in this place. so thankful that you've joined us in worship um, this morning. If you are a guest, our uh, minister of music and the music associate are out of town today, and so I'll be filling in and leading you in worship. But I'm so grateful for Miss April now and, and Stephen and Earl and all their services and, and how they lead us in worship each and every Sunday morning. And so we're grateful to help and be a part of this uh, service this morning. So we invite you to stand and join us this morning as we worship the one true living God. I search the world, it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise and treasures the faith never enough. And you came along, put me back together.
people said amen let's pray together gracious God as we come before you in worship today we praise you for your sustaining love and your continued guidance in each of our lives for you O oh God have sent us Jesus who is our guide our teacher and it is Jesus who modeled for us the way of love for the whole universe so God, we now offer ourselves to you through the service of worship and in obedience to your command in each of our lives. May our worship this day bring honor and glory to you alone. Loving God, we ask that you open our ears to hear your word this day and that you would draw us closer to you, that the whole world may be one with you as you are one with us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms. I'll be reading from Psalm 16, beginning with verse number 5. Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. And let us continue worshiping God as we hear this reminder that it is upon Jesus Christ and his foundation that we are to build our lives. Worthy of every song we could ever see. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy 
hope and prayer this morning that you will build your life upon the foundation that is Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. You may be seated. And our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John. I'll be reading from John chapter 11, beginning with verse number 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. And as we gather this morning in worship, that is the highest calling in each of our lives as followers of Jesus Christ, that we would proclaim his message of hope to the world around us so that they too may believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. Here at First Baptist Church, we seek to offer so many missions, opportunities, ministries in which we can help build others up to go out into the world and share the love of Christ with those around them. And one way in which we do that is through giving. And so this morning, we invite you to give of your tithes and your offerings so that you too can be a part of expanding God's kingdom here in this community and throughout the world. And so let us thank you in advance for your support of First Baptist Church and all that we seek to do to honor God. Let's go to God now in prayer. God, you are a God of mercy and healing. And God, we know and believe that you hear the cries of those in need. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we pray now that you would receive these tithes and these offerings of your people. It is our prayer that they may bless all who are in need so that those may come to know your peace, your comfort, and your courage. For God, you are a life-giving God. And yes, you can bring healing to our lives. And so, God, in this service of worship and in this act of giving, we acknowledge your wonderful deeds and offer to you thanks from generation to generation. For we pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. was hurt in these
We'll give a moment for our children to uh, exit, and we're glad that you're here today. I know it's a little different with Miss Pam not playing the exit music, but we thank Ashley for uh, teaching them today. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11. The sermon today is entitled, When Jesus Calls Your Name. <clears throat> this is a, a passage in context. It's recorded in John 11. In John 12, he will be anointed, and then he will begin his journey, his triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem, and then all the events of Passion Week will happen. Um, <clears throat> but it's a pivotal time in the life of uh, three of his favorite people. I think we can honestly say that in Scripture. Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he has spent a great deal of time uh, with them. And they have gotten word to, uh, to the Lord that Lazarus is sick. And yet, once Jesus gets the word, he tarries two more days. Then he heads to, uh, to Bethany. And on the outskirts there, uh, he's greeted by Martha. Four days uh, now, Lazarus has been in a tomb. The sermon today is when God, uh, Jesus calls your name. Uh, I do thank Pastor BJ and Earl and uh, Stephen and April for bringing us to the throne of the Lord through music so wonderfully well. As April was singing such a deep song, Thy Will Be Done, 
I know Jesus prayed that prayer. Um, I think we can say in hopes it was a prayer um, uh, that God might alleviate him for the cup that awaited him. I don't think Jesus had a death wish and he knew as a faithful Jew that the scriptures talk, uh, cursed is he who dies on a, on a cross. And Jesus prayed, if there be another way, let this cup pass from me. Even so, not my will be done, but thine be done. And there are times in life that I've really hoped, I've really prayed that my will would be done rather than God's will when it was maybe for a person who was coming to the end of their life. Um, perhaps it was a friend, perhaps it was a family member. And I'd prayed earnestly and devoutly that God would heal them, but God chose not to. And that's much of the situation we have here with Martha and Mary as they have prayed and sent for the Lord. Um, I have a, one of my best friends is a pastor in a neighboring city, and he's done a lot of funerals, and he told me this story some time ago that there was a family that uh, was going to have to have a funeral. The wife had passed, and the husband had come to him, and they'd gone to the funeral home. And um, they were at the receiving at the church, but everybody in the community knew that this husband and wife just didn't get along. They were faithfully married, but they just, I guess they communicated by bickering and arguing. Always they were arguing. And it was a contentious relationship. And she had passed away, and so they were having a funeral. But notwithstanding the fact that they were always at odds with one another, they were appealing people and had lots of friends and family. At the funeral, there was the receiving at the front of the church before the funeral was going to be conducted, and everyone would file by, and they'd pay the respects and go to the coffin and then go to the man Bob and give him their respects, tell her they were sorry that her, his wife had passed, and he would cordially greet them. But there was a little tension because everybody knew they just didn't get along. And after most of the folks had come by, it was getting close to the time that they would have the service proper and they were going to have to close the coffin. And he went up once more. And as he got before the coffin there at the altar, people could just see him shaking. And then they hear him crying and he's wailing. And it seemed so out of character. And the mortician, the funeral director came up and said, Bob, are you okay? He said, it seems a little out of character because y'all were always at odds. But he said, now you're just overwrought with this, this emotion. He said, I'm sure that all the years of your, your deep love for her now has just overcome you and you just can't control your emotions. And he looked at the mortician and said, no, I thought I saw her move. <laughs> well, we come to a place where it was not that way for Martha and Mary and Jesus. I don't know that they really ever had much tension, but there's some in the air now. And so, as we come to this passage, we've read how Jesus is in a neighboring town, and now he heads to Bethany. And verse 17 says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. It's not in scripture, but there was a, a feeling, there was kind of an a, a urban myth in the first century among the Jews that believed that once a person died, their spirit kind of hovered around the body for three days. But after three days, uh, there was no turning back. And that was because at times perhaps there had been uh, a resuscitation, a near-death experience. There's a great difference between what we have seen in our society where someone is revived or resuscitated that's not a resurrection. I thank God for modern, modern medical science that can revive a person, be it through uh, defibrillators or procedures or medications that so, when someone's getting close to the point of death, that they can be revived. That's not resurrection. And perhaps uh, in the first century, some of that had happened. Folks were thought to be dead, but then uh, they revived. But after... Three days were passed. At four days, there, there wasn't much hope, if any, of reviving. And so the Bible tells us that. And now it's been four days. I think in his um, eternal wisdom, Jesus knew this. He didn't want anybody to be uh, misunderstanding that this was a resuscitation, a near-death experience. No, 
Lazarus is dead as the proverbial doornail. And once he comes, we see this interaction. The first point today is simply that Jesus came to them. He came to them, and there are many Jews who had come to comfort Mary and Martha in the loss of their brothers, the Bible tells us. And when Martha perceives the Lord, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my father would not have died. I think that she is at once a little bit aggravated. She's disappointed that Jesus didn't come immediately. She knows that it's not too far had he left when he got word. He probably could have got there in time. Perhaps Jesus um, has reasons, but Mary, I think, and Martha, they're saying, we really don't understand. Lord, if you'd been here, he would not have died. We see sorrow. We see maybe a bit of aggravation. We see some disappointment. But we also see, also see faith because then she says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. In her own nudging way, I think Martha, thankful now that Jesus has come to Bethany, has come to be with them in their mourning, she says, I know that if you ask God for something, he'll give it to you. There's that hope. There's that hope that God might perform a miracle through Jesus because he's already done it. He's raised a child. He's raised a widow's only son. She knows of this. And so she says, I have this faith. And Jesus replies to her, your brother will rise again. And she says, I know, at the last resurrection, at that last day. Maybe she's losing the hope. But Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Um, I was in a study this week. It really, it, it touched me deeply when uh, the leaders said that, you know, resurrection is not just an event. It's not just something that happened for Jesus on that first getting up Sunday morning. It's not that which will happen when he returns and catches the church up. But resurrection happens for us in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, believe the gospel, repent of our sins, and ask him to be the Lord and Savior of our life. That's resurrection. And resurrection has a name, and that name is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. It's not just that there's going to be a resurrection, an event sometime in the future, that great getting up morning, but I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection and life, friends, has a name. And that name is Jesus. And Martha responds as Jesus says, do you believe this? Jesus says, whoever believes in me will live and though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. As Christians, it's wonderful that we die once, but we live twice. We're born of human conception. One day we will die, but if we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, we're born again. We'll not see the second death, the spiritual death that is reserved for those who will never accept Jesus Christ, who choose not to. You see, resurrection... Life has a name, and that name is Jesus. And he says, do you believe this? That's where the rubber hits the road, folks. Do we believe that Jesus can raise us from the dead? Do we believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Or will we reject him? And Martha says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I think that's remarkable that while she's still grieving, while she's just a little aggravated with Jesus, Martha is pulled back to confess Jesus as Lord. Jesus, I believe that you are the resurrection and the life. I believe you can raise my brother. I believe you are the Christ, the Messiah. You're the one that has been foretold. And so we go from there. And Martha goes and gets Mary. She's grieving in the house. There are people with her. And she says, the, the teacher is asking for you. 
She's met him out on the road. Martha is a woman of action. She's a woman of great faith. She's a woman who is a doer. You know the, the stories where when they're preparing for the Lord, Martha's there wanting to hear the teaching. Martha is in the kitchen getting everything ready. Martha is a proactive doer. She wants to meet Jesus outside the city. She goes to him, but Mary is grieving. She's heartbroken. And so Martha does what Martha does. She goes to take care of Mary. Mary, the teacher's here, and he's asking for you. And when she heard that, verse 29 says, she got up quickly and went to him. Well, Jesus had come to them. In their manner of counting time, he'd come late. But Mary came, and she doesn't just do an interrogation of Jesus as Martha does. The Bible says that she fell at his feet. She fell at his feet. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I don't think there's any collusion here. I don't think they've gotten their stories together to say, this is what you say to the Lord. I think it's just that heartfelt thing. If you'd been here, Lord, my brother wouldn't have died. You could have done something about it. When nobody else could, you could heal him. You made the blind see, the lame walk. You've raised the dead. You, Lord, could do what no one else could do. It's an, a statement of faith. It is a lament. It is grieving. It is praise all at once. And Jesus is touched. The Bible says, verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. There's two things that happened here, friends. Um, these are some words here that are difficult to translate. First of all, he's deeply moved in his spirit. He has compassion for them. He sees these two people who are now heart sick at the loss of this dear brother. And Jesus is not callous. He's compassionate. He's sensitive. And he's moved by this. And then the next word it says, and he's troubled. It's hard to translate that because most of us would think, well, Jesus, what troubles him? He's the Lord of glory. He can calm the storm. He can raise the dead. He can, he's a, a man of miracles, changes the water into wine. But he's troubled here. And the term in Greek, it, it could mean uh, in, in a way that we can grasp in English, it means to tremble. Now, I think Jesus was so moved by all the grief that he's perceiving. He has compassion. He's moved in his spirit for these who are grieving. Folks, I can tell you, most of us in this room, we've grieved deeply at one point in our life or, or, or sometime. I can think, I go back in my mind, I can think about those deepest times when tragedy befell me or another family and I had to go and inform someone that a loved one was not coming home again. Or a young person has come to an untimely end or someone who is extremely dear to you or to me has passed and it is hard to fully express and explain that kind of grief you can experience it it's hard to articulate it and I think even the Lord of glory stood there he's troubled he's trembling because he cares so deeply for you and for me when we are heart sick and when we are broken and grieving Jesus gets it and he cares and the Bible says in that verse that too often denigrates the verse in saying that it is the shortest verse in the Bible but it is perhaps one of the most revealing and powerful about the person of Jesus the Bible says that Jesus wept he saw her weeping Mary and those along with her, those who'd come to to show compassion and Jesus had taught us mourn with those who mourn rejoice with those who rejoice most of the time when we come alongside someone who's grieving it's not the words we say we don't have the answers we just grieve along with our loved one and walk with them and grieve with them and cry with them I love the story that's told about a little boy who had befriended his next door neighbor who was in his 
early 90s, the little boy was five, and his mother had cautioned him about going in too much to the next door neighbor because she felt like she was, uh, the little boy was aggravating the neighbor. So she went and visited with the couple and he said, I, if Johnny comes here too much, just send him home. But he loves y'all, but I understand he's got a lot of energy. And they said, oh no, we love him. He didn't dear himself to the older couple and then the lady died of a heart attack. And little Johnny wanted to go next door and his mother said, no son, you can't go. Uh, Mrs. Jane passed away and Mr. John is grieving and she won't be coming back and she tried to explain to him about death and she did her best and he thought he understood by the next day he just couldn't stand it she was looking around for him couldn't find him went next door and sure enough he was there they were in uh, the living room spending some time together his mother was kind of stern with him said Johnny you got to come home now and come home and she got him home. She said, you've got to leave him alone. He's got to grieve. We, you know, at your age, at five years old, what could you do? And the little boy looked at her just as honestly as he could. He said, I just helped him cry. I've always appreciated that. I just helped him cry. But that's what Jesus did. He saw them. He cried because he cared. And this word in verse 35, it's not that wailing that some of the Jews were doing. They were so taken and so overwrought with the death of Lazarus and the grief of Mary and Lazarus that the word that is used there for their mourning is a wailing. And as a pastor, I've been in those places before, a few times, where in a funeral home, someone was just so overwhelmed by grief and loss that they wailed. I mean, to the top of their lungs, wailing, just pouring out their heart to God. It was not for show. It was not anything that was distasteful it was just how they were dealing with the moment there were a couple of times family members said pastor would you go to them and i would go to them and say you know you need to express this as best you can but that kind of wailing can sometimes bring a, a, a an ill ease to other folks and it's unusual to us well, that's what many of the Jews were doing. They were wailing, pouring out their emotions to God in ways that only death can cause us to do. That's not what Jesus does. The Greek word here is it's a soft sobbing. And it amazes me as I look at this passage because Jesus knows that he is about to raise Lazarus. He has planned this. This is no surprise. He has told his disciples earlier, they say, Lord, we need to go. The Lord tarries there, ministering in that town. He says, you know, we'll go when we'll go, but Lazarus is asleep. And they say, well, if he's sleeping, he doesn't need us. And the Bible says he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad he is. God's glory is going to be displayed in ways that nothing else can bring forth when we go. Lazarus is dead. He knew it. This is no surprise. And Jesus knows what he's going to do. This is not impulsive. It's not an impetuous act. But knowing that he's about to call Lazarus forth from death to life physically, he sees these loved ones weeping, and Jesus sobs along with us. In those moments that it seems like nothing can console us, we need to know. I've heard people say, where is God where is Jesus? And in those most heart-wrenching times in my life, I know that at least it's my belief that Jesus was with me and that he wept with me. In those tragedies where someone had befallen violence or accident or the end of a long battle with a disease, I truly believe, beloved, that Jesus cared. Yes, there are times that he could heal. I've been on the other side of that with loved ones, parents and family members and prayed with all my might that God would heal them. But I hear the words of April's song and the words of Jesus saying, even so, not my will but thine be done. There are times that we realize God's will has been done. Death has come, someone has gone, 
And now nothing can change that in the mind of those there, but Jesus knows differently. He came, he cared, he cried. He's not ashamed as the Lord of glory to weep in front of them. And when he weeps, look at how people react. I guess the first four decades of my life, maybe not quite that long, but I, as I think about it, I didn't prepare to say this, but I was 33. I was preaching in another state at another Baptist church. I was preaching on the cross of Jesus, and I was overwhelmed by the Spirit of God and the depth of Jesus' sacrifice for me. And I was so overwhelmed in that, in that sanctuary of that Baptist church in Roanoke, Virginia, that I couldn't get through the next sentence. I was just weeping so hard. And many of the people didn't know what to do because before that date, I could tell you now, I'd never wept in public. I'd faced death's door. I'd had broken bones. I had been beaten. I'd been in, in various accidents where sometimes it was not sure if I'd live or not. Never cried. I was raised not to let people see you cry. Don't let people see you out of sorts. Don't let people see you sweat. Now, that one went a long time ago, but you get the feeling. It was like if I allowed people to see my emotions or, or see me weep, it was like I was less than a man. But the Spirit broke my heart that day because I realized while I was preaching, it just overwhelmed me that Jesus didn't have a death wish. He was 33. He was in the prime of life. For those of you who are 33 or close to it, I hope you, are, I hope you, you know how much God loves you. I hope you're blessed. I hope you're enjoying life. Because the Bible's true. I mean, I still think, you know, there's a part of me, I think I'm 35, but I'm not. I'm not. Jesus was 33, and he's facing the cross. And I was just overwhelmed by how much somebody could love me and you that they would willingly die on a cross for my sins, for someone who was an enemy of God. For God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I was overwhelmed with that and I began to weep and weep and weep. And my wife was concerned for me and a few of the church leaders didn't know if they needed to come and, and help me down and call them in with the white coats or whatever. And there's one man up in the, the last corner of the balcony of that church, a tough individual. And he, he walked the aisle and his wife and children were bringing me his weeping like he couldn't stop. He got saved right there that night. Had the same name as I do. I wouldn't tell you, but just, his name was Jerry. And I said, Jerry, what are you coming to do? He says, I realize how much God loves me. I realize how much Jesus loves me. You know, they saw Jesus weeping. They saw this man's man, this former carpenter i don't see jesus as just some milk toast type of individual i think he was a man's man i think he was tough i think he had to be tough all the things he went through people trying to kill him all the slander all the even his family coming and saying you know we need to take him home he's a lunatic that's what the scripture says in king james some say he has a devil can you imagine all that's going on and boy he was strong and though he's strong and now he's headed to Jerusalem and they expect that he's going to be killed there. Unless you think I'm adding to the story, look at verse 16. Jesus says, Lazarus is dead for your sake. I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And when he says go to him, they realize Bethany, as the scriptures told us, is only two miles from Jerusalem. And Thomas, courageous Thomas, I don't like it when people call him doubting Thomas. No, he's courageous Thomas. He says, to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Jesus knows what he's doing, and so does Thomas. Jesus is not afraid, but he is compassionate, and he does care so much that he weeps with those who weep, that he understands you when you say, God, it's not fair that someone died sooner than I wanted. I know Martha and Mary would understand that. Lord, 
If you'd have been here, he hadn't have died. Mary worshiped me at his feet. Lord, if you'd just been here, he wouldn't have died. And honest to God, how many times have I said that? Lord, if you'd just do a miracle, this loving one wouldn't die, at least not right now. Can we be honest to God? But God's got bigger purposes. I decided I wanted to share this story because I've shared it with you a couple of times. The first time I ever shared it, that didn't feel right because it's so personal. But some of you may need to hear it. I don't know. When my dad got um, colon cancer, they said, oh, it's nothing. It's just a polyp. Went in. They said, well, it's more than a polyp. It's a small thing. Well, then another test. It's more than a thing. It's a tumor. But it hasn't gone beyond the colon wall. And then when they did surgery, oh, it's gone to the liver, but we don't think it's anything. And then, well, it's in one part of the liver, but it's not going to be bad. Then it's in both parts of the liver. And then before long, it's, there's nothing we can do. And so we travel that journey with him. And in the midst of that, God did a miracle for us in that we conceived with Emma. And I prayed, Lord, just let him see Emma. And so he did. He survived long enough to see my firstborn. But he didn't make it to her first birthday. And <clears throat> back to that stuff, of, you know, not letting people see you grieve and pull yourself up with your bootstraps and stuff. I still had a generous dose of that. So my dad passed on a Thursday. We buried him on a Saturday. And on Sunday, I was back in the pulpit and I preached five times that Sunday. I didn't take enough time to grieve. People who loved me and, and knew better said, you need to take some time off. And they were right, but I didn't. Too much about duty and loyalty and those type of things. And so fast forward a couple of years and I was still grieving. And I was in my prayer closet at my office in Charlotte. And um, I was praying and I didn't hear an audible voice. Never heard an audible voice. But there's times in my life that I knew without a doubt the Spirit of God was speaking to me. Didn't hear a voice, but, but I felt the feelings, the message in my heart, my mind. To this day, those are the most powerful movings I've ever had in my life. And this one was in my prayer closet, and I was like, you know, Lord, I prayed for healing for other people, and you've, you've done some wondrous things. That's the beauty of it. We have seen some healings at this church that, that people, doctors have literally told me, you know, it's going to be a couple hours, and that person is going to be gone. And those people are still here serving God with us right now. Three times I've seen that happen in this church. It's amazing. And I'd seen it before, you know, because, you know, God is sovereign. He can do what he wants. Sometimes it's to take people home. Sometimes it's to grant the healing. But God is sovereign. He gets to choose. And I respect that and I understand that. That's a huge issue. I don't have the power nor the inclination to be frivolous with God and just say, God, how about doing this? God, I'd like a Mercedes, or God, I'd like a new chainsaw, or God, I'd like a, a new truck. What? That's No. But when it's God, will you heal my dad so he can spend some time with his only grandchild? Yeah, I was, a little, I was a little angry with God, and then I felt guilty. How can you be angry with God? Who am I to be angry with God? And a godly minister told me one time, he said, Jerry, God can handle your anger. Just be honest with him. And so if you're angry at God over something, you feel like you got shortchanged, I understand. And so does God. There's an old Jewish prayer. I read it in a prayer book once in a, in a synagogue, in a temple. and said that God prefers your love, but he'll accept your hate. What he doesn't want is your indifference. I remembered that. I wasn't indifferent, but I was a little angry with God. And I was like, God... Why couldn't you just let my dad live another year or two? And I didn't hear the voice, but in my heart, the words came to me and said, Jerry, if your dad could come back right now, and I was prepared to hear this wondrous word from God, 
And the next part of that just shocked me. Jerry, if your dad could come back from the grave right now, if he could come back from heaven to be with you and your family, he wouldn't. And in my prayer closet on my knees, I was shocked. I'm like, what are you talking about, God? He said, if your dad could come back, he wouldn't, for he is with me. He is in perfection. He's in heaven where there is no sin, no darkness, no pain. He had been through so much. There's no more sorrow, no tears. And then he's with his forebears, his father that was taken from him when he was six, not 31. And I was amazed at God. And I'll tell you, friends, when God said that to me, I'll tell you, and now I still <clears throat> miss my dad. But I, the grieving ended there and the rejoicing because my dad was with our Father in heaven, with those who went before him at perfect peace and awaiting the rest of us. I mean, I went from being kind of ticked at God to, I can tell you honestly, I've never looked back. Do I miss my dad? Yes. Do I miss my mom? Yes. Do I wish they were back? Sentimentally, yes, but spiritually, no. Why would I want them to leave the perfection of heaven to come back? And I say all this because one theologian this week that I read for the first time ever said perhaps part of Jesus' weeping was he was so moved and compassionate and troubled at the pain they were feeling, but also he was about to call Lazarus back from the joys and the perfection of heaven of being in paradise with God. Now, I just offer that as one who read another theologian that intrigued me. But this I do know is that those who were around and saw Jesus' tears, heard his words, they said, verse 36, see how Jesus loved him. Friends, Mary and Martha are grieving so deeply because they love so deeply. For those of you who are grieving deeply, it's because you had the capacity and the inner fortitude and the faith and the love of God in your life to love so deeply. And those of us who love deeply, we grieve deeply, but we also hope extravagantly. Because I know without a doubt, when I see Jesus, I'll see those who went before me. And you have the same hope if you're a follower of Christ. And he's teaching Mary and Martha and disciples and you and me something here. Death is not the end. Yes, it is painful, but it does not have the victory. Paul could write, oh, death, where's thy sting? Oh, death, where's thy victory? But praise be to God who gives us victory over death through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Jesus weeps and they say, oh, how he loved him. But there's always some naysayers. Maybe they were just grieving so deeply, I can't judge them. They say, could not one who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So, Mary has taken him to the place where Lazarus lays. And once more, the Bible says, Jesus was deeply moved. That word, that compassionate movement, He's moved with compassion, with love. And he came to the tomb. And I think maybe some of Jesus' movement, remembering he does not have a death wish, he is seeing right before him, his eyes some foreshadowing. It's a tomb. It has a rock over it. Lazarus is dead. In a week or so, he'll die on the cross for my sins and for yours. He'll be nailed there. He'll be reviled, spat upon. They'll gamble for his clothes. They'll insult him. One will say, Lord, remember me when you come into paradise. He'll say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He'll finish the, the work. He'll cry out, Tetelestai, which means paid in full. And then he'll say, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You're just thinking, he, he, don't you mean he says it is finished? That's the way we translate, but... It's a financial term. It means paid in full. My sins, yours. The debt's been paid. And then he'll die. And they'll stab him in the side to make sure. And out'll flow blood and water. 
Then they'll lay him in a tomb and they'll wrap him. They'll set a stone. They'll seal it and they'll place a guard. Oh yeah, I think he's troubled in spirit. I think there's a part of Jesus that would just say, Lord, if I only had another three years to pour myself into these men, some of them are not ready. If I only had a three, more, three more years to, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to proclaim your glory. Maybe he's thinking that. That's the way I think. He's troubled. He's at the cave and he says, take away the stone. I'm <coughs> intrigued because Mary says, but Lord, excuse me, Martha, action Martha says, but Lord, she's longing for this. If you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. But Lord, so many times God has something greater in store for us and we're, but Lord, by this time there's a bad odor for he's been there for four days. Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe you would see the glory of God? And so they take away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, for their benefit, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. <clears throat> and so... When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. I'm going to take just a quick aside right here. I was in two events last week before last. One was a, a prayer ministry event. A lot of pastors there, a lot of lay folks there. And at one point, there was a, a gentleman from another church, and he called out to his minister in this group, and he said, Pastor, and about five of us turned around, and he realized he needed to be more specific than that. <clears throat> Was uh, I was at a, a ball game uh, a week or so ago, and we were in, in a group of young men, and somebody said, hey, coach, and about four or five people turned around and looked. You know, you fancy yourself a coach or a pastor, somebody calls you, you turn around and look. But there were numerous coaches. There were numerous pastors in the room. You see, there were probably numerous people in that cave. <clears throat> Jesus was blessed by a man who was rich, who allowed that he'd be buried in a borrowed tomb in whom nobody, no one had ever lived. But most tombs were kind of like our idea of a mausoleum. You had to maximize the space. It was usually in a cave or a place hewn out, and there'd be lots of bodies in there. And so Jesus doesn't just say, come out. He says, Lazarus, come out. Because when Jesus calls to you, he calls your name. He, he's going to have some specificity about it. Because had Jesus just said, come out, I think they'd have had the day of the zombies that day. All of them would come running out. I mean, it, it's, these days it's like you can't write a movie or a t television show without the undead being in it, right? Jesus is specific. The Bible says they're disappointed to every person who wants to die and then the judgment. There's people in there that had their chance to live a righteous life, that had their chance before Christ to live according to the law, that had perhaps had their chance to receive him as the Lord of glory, as Lazarus and Martha and Mary had. It is appointed to man once to live and die, and then the judgment. And so now he's displaying the glory of God, so he doesn't call everybody to come out, it's just Lazarus. Lazarus come out. And that's the way God still is. He doesn't say to you, oh, family of God, come into the kingdom of heaven. No, he comes to us specifically, every person at a time. And Jesus calls your name. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says that Jesus gives this wondrous picture. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open that door, I will come in and abide with him and stay with him and live with him. And God calls to us by name. He knows your name. And for those who, who receive him and believe him, the Bible says that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. It's not your social security number. It's not your username. It's not with your password. God writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. So, friend, when Jesus calls your name, you got a choice. You can answer and believe and experience resurrection because resurrection has a name. And that name is Jesus. And you have a name. I know most of them, but I don't know all of them.
But God knows your name. The Bible says that the good shepherd knows his sheep by name and they know him and they recognize his voice. And friend, if you've never made peace with God, if you've never gotten to the mature place as a human being that you can say, I've sinned and come short of the glory of God, you need to know that God loves you and that he's calling you. He knew you before you were born. He knew you when you were growing in your mother's womb, the book of Jeremiah says. And he loves us. And he calls us by name. And so you need to know God loves you and he calls you specifically. I'll not get to heaven because of the faith of my godly grandmothers or parents. I can only get to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ by his grace. We are saved by grace through faith, not by works lest anyone should boast. Not my works, not yours, not anybody else's. But know this, Jesus loves you. He'll go to every length, every length, to show how much he loves you. He wept there. The Bible says he had sweat drops as of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he hung on a cruel cross so that we might be able to see how much he loves us. When Jesus calls your name, you just got one of two choices. You can believe and receive him, open the door, and he'll come in and abide with you. You walk with him the rest of your life and grow. Or you can reject him. And Jesus is a gentleman. He won't kick the door in. Perhaps the greatest gift God has given us, most of the time when I say that, I think of salvation and God's grace, but perhaps the greatest gift he's given us is the ability to choose. Grace. We're not robots. He didn't make us where we had to. He gave us the choice. You can choose to love him or you can choose to reject him. You can choose salvation or you can choose separation. But the choice is yours. And if you've never heard the call of Jesus, he loves you. And he wants you to be with him eternally. And it's simple. It's not just a formula. It's the beginning of a walk, of a journey, of a life with God. The scripture says that every person has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Might be as terrible as murder or as taking God's name in vain or disobeying your parents, but we've all sinned and come short of God's glory. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. A, a wage is something you earn. I earned my death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus and a gift you can't earn. At best, you simply accept it and are thankful to the one who made it or bought it or procured it for you that's what Jesus did and here's the way that you can accept that gift if you've never done it before the Bible says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord believing God raised him from the dead you shall be saved so friend if you've never understood the plan of salvation that's God in God's intention for you he loves you he's calling you by name he offers you eternal life we pray that you'll accept it would you pray with me? Eternal God, I give you praise and honor and glory for every person in this building, in this community, in this city, in this nation, on this globe who has heard you call their name and who's responded, saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one sent from heaven for the redemption of the world. Lord, I pray that if there's one here today who's not accepted your grace and your forgiveness, that today might be the day that they begin that journey of faith with Christ Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so, Lord, now bless us as we respond during this invitation to life. Bless us as we respond to the call to salvation from the shepherd who knows our name. And be with us, Lord, as we embrace the service that the Savior calls us to. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you now to respond as the Spirit of God may lead you as we stand and sing our hymn of decision. Would you rise? Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy